Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in a listen-only mode for today's conference. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Ms. Janice Wingo, International Trade Administration. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you, and welcome to today's China IP webinar, which is hosted by the International Trade Administration of the United States Department of Commerce. Today we're going to be talking about trade secret protection in China, and we're very lucky to have with us from Beijing on the other end of the line in the very wee hours of the morning, um, Mr. Gui Jia. Um, lawyer, lawyer Gui um, has represented a mini multinational corporation in trade secret matters. He worked for um, a very large international law firm in China and a quite renowned uh, Chinese law firm. He has experience in, um, in training his clients in trade, trade protection, and I'd like to mention that not only is he admitted in China, he is admitted to the bar in California. Oh, and he's also, he got his, L, he got his LLM degree from um, Renda. So without further ado, I'm going to let um, lawyer Gui take it away. Hello. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to use this opportunity to share with you my past experience in trade secret protection in China. I'll try to use uh, the one hour time to give you some basic information about trade secret protection in China, and uh, I will also give you some advice on how to protect your trade secrets in China. Okay. Uh, to begin my presentation, uh, let us first have a look at today's discussion agenda. Uh, we will talk about uh, what a uh, trade secret is and uh, what constitutes uh, trade secret infringement. Uh, we will also introduce the remedies to infringement, uh, three options actually, civil, administrative, and criminal. Uh, the last part where we will recommend uh, some ways to protect your trade secrets in China. Okay. Okay, first, what is a trade secret? The definition is contained in the Article 10 of the PRC anti anti competition law. Uh, it defines uh, trade secrets as technical information and operational information, which is not known to the public. Uh, which is capable of bringing economic benefits to the owner, uh, which has practical applicability and which the owners of the rights have taken uh, some reasonable measures to keep secret. Uh, and, you know, I know in the U.S. most states have adopted a uniform uh, trade secrets act. Uh, you may have noticed that the definition of trade secrets in the PRC and the Empire Competition Law is similar with the definition under uh, the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Uh, you know, the definition of trade secrets under the Chinese law in, uh, includes the requirement of not known to the public. But what does it mean? Article 9 of one uh, interpretation promulgated by the Supreme People's Court in 2005 and provides that if the information may not be aware of by the related personnel in the field the, therefrom and is difficult to be obtained, it shall be deemed as unknown to the public. So it's provided some kind of guidance to us. Okay, the trade secret owner uh, shall bear some duties of protection over his trade secret. Uh, as we mentioned, the Article 10 of the PRC and the Empire Competition Law requires that uh, the owner to take some uh, reasonable confidentiality measures to protect his trade secret. Uh, the PRC Supreme Court made some examples in its uh, 2007 interpretation, which has mentioned that. Uh, these uh, exemption, uh, these uh, examples, uh, examples uh, include uh, concluding non-disclosure agreement, i.e. the NDA, with personnel, adopting passwords or codes on classified information, 
tagging confidentiality sign on a carrier of the classified information, limiting disclosure of confidential information to necessary personnel, uh, and requesting uh, company visitors to pro uh, protect confidential information. You know, the list is now exclusive. So you can actually take whatever uh, confidentiality measures you think reasonable to protect your trade secret. Uh, anyway, you must do something. You you can't totally ignore any protection. Okay. Why do we need to protect our technology as a trade secret? Uh, what about protecting it as a uh, patent? Here we have a comparison of the trade secret with the patent. Uh, you know, the trade secret is, uh, is not known to the public, but the, uh, 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 under the patent system, you need to disclose your patent technology to the public. So there is no need uh, for the trade secret owner to disclose its technology to the authority, but uh, the trade secret owner needs protection of the confidential information. For the patent owner, uh, they must file patent application with the patent authority. Uh, for the duration of protection, uh, the trade secret, prote uh, the, dur uh, the, the period of uh, the protection could be very long. Uh, and uh, but uh, you know, for the patent owner, they have the fixed term of protection. And you know, in China, the trade secret owner, if he wanna. Uh, 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 initiative a uh, civil action uh, at a court, uh, the owner will bear a very, very heavy, heavy burden of proof. Uh, for the patent owner, if they want to uh, sue somebody at a court, they have a, a heavy burden of proof. Yeah. Uh, what constitutes trade secret infringement? Article 10 of the uh, Chinese anti anti competition law pro uh, prohibits, uh, prohibits uh, three uh, direct uh, infringements. It's obtaining business uh, secrets from the owners uh, by stealing, promising of gain, resorting to cohesion or other illegal gains, that means. And number two, disclosing, using, or allowing others to use the trade secret uh, of the owner obtained by the means mentioned in the preceding section. And number three, disclosing, using, or allowing others to use uh, the trade secret uh, that he has obtained by breaking an engagement uh, or disregarding the requirement of the owners of the, uh, the right to preserve the trade secret. We will take some examples later. Okay, uh, you know, Article 10 of the PRC anti fraud Competition Law also provides that where a third party obtains, uses, or discloses the uh, business secrets of others, when the third party has or should have full knowledge of the illegal acts mentioned in the preceding act, uh, section, the third party shall be deemed to have infringed uh, on the uh, trade secrets uh, owner's rights. Okay, you know, in your case, the PRC Supreme Court rules that selling of products produced as a result of uh, trade secret infringement does not constitute trade secret infringement. So uh, if party A stole a technology from a trade secret owner and used the, the, the stolen technology to produce a, a kind of product later on, and party B sold the, the produced product to the public, then party B selling per se does not constitute a trade secret infringement, particularly when uh, party B did not know the existence of the misappropriation of the trade secrets. Uh, in addition, under the 2007 uh, interpretation, uh, the Supreme Court also said that uh, reverse engineering is not an infringement. Uh, this is uh, similar with the Uniform Trade uh, Secrets Act uh, in the U.S. 
uh, because the Act expressly states that reverse engineering does not constitute misappropriation of trade secrets. In recent practice in China, in more and more cases, actually, the defendant used the reverse engineering as a defense uh, to the infringement charge. Please note, however, Article 12 of the 2007 uh, interpretation also says that if the defendant knows the trade secrets by, uh, by um, identifiable uh, measures and then claims its acquisition as lawful, it is accused of reverse engineering, then the claim should not be upheld by the court. Let's look at remedies to infringement. In China, the owner can have three kinds of uh, remedies, namely civil, administrative, and criminal. It has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, first, to pursue civil actions, the owner can have multiple claims and the petition for damages. Uh, and civil cases can be combined with criminal actions. Uh, plaintiffs can select a place for filing of the lawsuit. I recall the plaintiffs can farm shop the venue. Uh, but uh, civil proceedings ha are very kind of time consuming, expensive, and plaintiffs usually have a very heavy burden of proof. Yeah, this is civil action. Uh, for administrative actions, they're quick and cheap. And the AIC officers uh, who are in charge of enforcing the rights via the administrative actions may accept evidence that is not as formal as evidence used in court actions. So sometimes you may not have to submit notarized evidence to the officer, uh, to the AIC officers. But ideally, you can submit all evidence that has been notarized. Although most evidence needed for uh, starting an uh, administrative action shall be provided by the complainant, i.e. the right owner, sometimes the AIC officers may even collect the infringing evidence on its own initiative. But in practice, this uh, rarely happened. But officers are usually reluctant to act due to local protectionism and uh, administrative decisions are still subject to judicial reviews, uh, so which means that uh, if you are not satisfied with the judicial uh, administrative decision, you can appeal it to, to a court. Uh, and in administrative actions, officers are only able to handle non-complex cases so they often do not have the technical knowledge to make a decision on a complicated case. And what is more, they cannot rule on uh, damages. They cannot uh, order the infringer to pay damages uh, to the complainant. But uh, the officers can mediate over the two parties' negotiation uh, on the damages. We will further detail that later. Besides, uh, people sometimes complain that the administrative fines are usually not sufficient to act as a deterrent. This is the administrative uh, action. For the criminal action, uh, they have a very strong, uh, they have actually the strongest uh, deterrent, and the officers can use an only available to police means to collect uh, evidence. Uh, criminal action do not need to cost a lot to the owner, and the case may be combined with a uh, uh, civil action. But, uh, you know, officers are also reluctant to act because of the local protectionism, and there are high thresholds for an infringement to amount to a crime. Okay. Okay, let us first talk about civil actions. As, uh, I guess most of you will be very interested in hearing that. First page, what legal ground can the plaintiff face his case on? A plaintiff can file a suit on cause of action of trade secret infringement or breach of confidentiality agreement. So it depends upon whether there is a confidentiality agreement. Where no contract has been concluded, 
the claim can be made under the PRC uh, anti unfair competition law for infringement only. So this is a tort claim. In contract, where one well, contract has uh, been concluded, then the claim can be made uh, under the PRC labor contract law if the infringer is the owner's former uh, employee, or the claim can be made under the PRC contract law for kind of general breach of contracts, for instance, uh, for breach of licensing agreement uh, or partnership agreement, etc. Uh, please note, even if a contract has been signed, uh, the trade secret owner can still sue for a trade secret infringement suit because one element of satisfying the infringement suit is to show that the owner has taken necessary measures to protect the trade secret and asking the cooperation party to sign a confidentiality agreement can meet this agreement. You may remember I mentioned that, uh, which is incorporated uh, under the 2007 interpretation. However, please also note, if the owner wants to sue for an infringement cause of action, he or she will bear a very heavy burden of proof. For example, uh, the owner also has to prove that the trade secret needs is not known to the public requirement, as we discussed. In contrast, it is relatively easy for a plaintiff to prove the fact of breach of contract. In any event, whether to sue the infringer on, on the basis of a tort claim or uh, a breach of contract claim depends upon case-by-case -case situations. Okay, page number two. On this page, we will discuss about who has a standing to sue in a civil action and uh, which level of Chinese court has the jurisdiction to hear the case. Okay, who has standing to sue? Under the uh, Article 15 of the 2007 uh, interpretation, the trade secret owner can sue, and the sole licensee alone can sue. Here, let's pause for, uh, for, for a moment. Uh, what is a sole license? Under Chinese laws, a sole license is a license under which only the licensee can use the trade secret. So even the uh, right owner itself cannot use the uh, trade secret. In contract, under an exclusive license, both the licensor and the licensee can use the trade secret. So this is a difference between the sole license and the exclusive license. Let's go back to our discussion. So the sole licensee alone can sue. The exclusive licensee plus licensor or owner together can sue. Exclusive licensee alone can sue. If License or owner fails to sue. And non-exclusive licensee plus license or owner together can sue. Non-exclusive licensee alone can sue, only if authorized by the license or owner. Okay, so which level of court has the jurisdiction to hear trade secret infringement case? According to Article uh, 18 of, of the 2007 interpretation, uh, generally the intermediate people's court can hear this uh, kind of case. But there are some exceptions. Uh, the district people's court, which is a lower level uh, court, uh, if this kind of court has been approved by the Supreme Court, and then the district people's court can hear the case. Uh, for example, the Beijing Chaoyang District People's Court can hear the trade secret infringement case, and Guangzhou uh, Bai Yun District People's Court can hear this kind of case. Okay. Okay, let's talk about pre-litigation interim uh, measures. Here we're referring to court actions, not actions by other means. First, regarding the preliminary injunction, it is not possible for a plaintiff to get a preliminary injunction because there is no statutory basis for trade secret infringement actions. Although there are statutory basis for other IP lawsuits, so we can move for a preliminary injunction in a copyright case, in a patent case, or in a trademark infringement case, but not 
in a trade secret case, not uh, in a domain di no domain name dispute, not uh, in an enterprise name dispute. Second. For the uh, uh, evidence preservation uh, by court, it is also not available, as there is no law allo uh, allowing that. Uh, however, please note, before instituting a lawsuit, the plaintiff can also request a notary public to do the pre-litigation uh, evidence preservation, although the plaintiff cannot petition the court to make it. You know, unlike a court uh, action to do the evidence preservation, the notary public cannot force the infringer to do something. Rather, they just witness what the parties have done and record that in a notarial deed uh, written documentation. So the action made by the notary public is much weaker than the court action. In spite of that, actually, before launching a lawsuit, it is very common and regular for the plaintiff to preserve and collect the evidence under the supervision and the witness of a notary public. So it's also worth noting that after filing a, a lawsuit with the court, then the plaintiff can petition the court to pres uh, preserve the evidence, as it is allowed under the Article 74 of the PRC uh, Civil Procedure Law. You know, in practice, uh, we file with the court uh, the bill of complaint together with the motion for evidence preservation, and ideally the judge can approve our motion for evidence preservation and execute the uh, evidence preservation at the same time when the court serves the complaint to the would-be defendant. Under such circumstances, uh, uh, you know, the evidence preservation will have the same effect with the preliminary uh, evidence preservation. Third, it is also possible for for plaintiff to petition for pre uh, litigation property preservation, so long as some conditions mentioned in the Article 93 of the PRC uh, Civil Procedure Law have been met. Uh, these conditions include, for example, the number one, the circumstance must be urgent. Uh, number two, there must be a possibility for the plaintiff to suffer unremedial. Uh, unremediable harms, even preliminary uh, litigation property preservation is not granted. And number three, a surety must be provided. A bond must be provided to to, to the court. This is an ex parte motion, uh, you know, um, meaning that the court will make a decision after reviewing uh, the motion documentation uh, submitted by the plaintiff. So the court will not ask for opinion from the other side, and the court will not forward the plaintiff motion documentation to the would-be defendant. Uh, here we have a tip for for the property preservation. Better for the plaintiff to get the bank account information of the would-be defendant, because if the plaintiff can manage to get that information, then it will be very convenient for the court to execute the pre-litigation property as a preservation. So then the chance of success will be high. Last, you know, in practice, uh, if the would-be defendant is a very famous and large cooperation, uh, 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 then the, the, the court will usually not uh, grant the per litigation property preservation motion because the court will believe that even if the plaintiff wins the case, they do not need to worry about the execute of, of the final judgment because the large corporation has plenty of money to pay for the rules of damages. Okay. What are the court remedies? The court can order to enjoy the infringer from conducting the infringement, so you can get a permanent injunction. Generally, it lasts uh, no longer than when the trade secret has been uh, aware of by the public. In addition, you can also claim for legal or restitutionary damages, but not both. I know in the U.S., According to the Uniform uh, Trade Secret Act, the plaintiff is entitled to both the actual loss uh, caused by the misappropriation 
uh, and the infringers unjust enrichment. But here in China, you can only be entitled to either the actual loss or the illegal gain. Then regarding how to determine the uh, damages, uh, Article uh, 17 of the 2007 interpretation make, it makes it clear that uh, damages may be determined with reference to measures determining uh, damages for patent infringements. Article uh, 65 of the new patent law says that the orders for determining damages for patent infringement are, number one, uh, the owner's actual losses. And if that cannot be figured out, then the second order is to ascertain the infringer's uh, illegal uh, profits. Uh, but if neither of the two can be found out, uh, reasonably uh, multiplied amounts of patent royalties can be uh, the reference. And lastly, uh, the court can set a statutory damages. The cap for the statutory damages is 1 million uh, RMB. So this is the order to determine the amount of damages. Please note, <coughs> some judges believe that uh, in trade secret infringement cases, it is not appropriate to use the amount of royalties, i.e. the number three order, to determine the damages. So this is a little bit disputable. <coughs> Okay, let's move to administrative actions. Uh, the governing authority is the state administration for industry and commerce and its national-wide branches. We call it AIC. And you know the, the state administration, uh, state AIC has its own uh, regulation. It's been issued uh, a long time ago, but it's still uh, valid right now. You know, uh, in the administrative actions, uh, the ASC officers uh, are usually reluctant to take uh, action in a case involving complex technical issues. We just talk, uh, mentioned that. Yeah, let's move to page number two. So what can ASC do? The AIC officers can order the infringer to cease the infringement and impose fines of up to 200,000 uh, RMB. Uh, you know, AIC cannot order the infringer to pay damages, but the AIC can mediate the two parties' uh, negotiation on the amount of damages compensation. Uh, you may have known that uh, in China, in all IP administrative actions, the administrative uh, officers uh, do not have the power to order the respondent, i.e. the suspect uh, infringer, to pay damages to the complainant. Uh, you know, recently the Chinese patent law is under uh, consideration of uh, amendment, and the proposed amendment has included one article empowering the patent administrative officers to order the infringer to pay uh, damages. So if the proposed amendment of the uh, patent law can be uh, passed, then there will be a big impact on the patent enforcement in China. But anyway, for trade secret infringement, the administrative uh, officers still cannot order the infringer to pay the compensation uh, to the right owner. But please note, uh, if the infringer is enjoyed or fined by the AIC, and he is not satisfied with uh, the administrative order, he can seek a judicial review over the order by means of filing a kind of the administrative lawsuit with a court. Uh, so the administrative decision is not final; it's still subject to judicial review. Uh, I I just uh, put a photo. Uh, actually, this is the. Uh, the kind of uh, seizure conducted by the administrative authority in China. So, yeah, it's uh, maybe uh, in your eye, uh, in your eye, you may see that it's uh, similar. They, they look like they're similar to the police, but actually there's some difference between their function. Okay, what about criminal action? Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, first, if someone steals your, uh, you know, trade secrets and it eventually causes substantial uh, losses to your company, you may want to hold the infringer uh, criminally liable. So here we discuss a little bit uh, about the criminal actions. Uh, who is the governing authority? The Public Security Bureau is the governing authority. They are the police in China, and uh, we, all, we will talk about how they will handle criminal cases later. Uh, what about governing laws? Uh, we have a PRC criminal law, and one interpretation jointly issued by the Supreme People's Court and the Supreme People's Procuratorate. So how do criminal actions start? We have actually two ways, the public action way and the private action way. Uh, public action is the traditional and the typical way to prosecute the infringer. Under this way, the trade owner uh, files a complaint with the PSB, the local PSB. Uh, alternatively, the AIC officer may also uh, trigger the proceeding by transferring the case to the police. If during an uh, administrative action, the PIC has found the infringement to have met uh, the minimum criminal threshold. So there are two ways to trigger the public action. Uh, upon receiving the complainant, uh, no, after receiving the complaint from the owner or the report from the AIC, the PSB will carry out the investigation to collect uh, criminal evidence. If further collection of the evidence is needed, by, uh, uh, the, if the PSB thinks the evidence is not sufficient, they will do that. And then if sufficient evidence of uh, crime is already there, uh, then the PSB will take the case to the public uh, prosecutor for prosecution. Uh, this is the public uh, action. The second way is to pursue a private action under which the trade secret owner may have already got some evidence, but, you know, for whatever reason, the police did not want to put forward this case, or, you know, even the police may not get involved in this case at all. So the owner has to do that on its own. So the owner launches the legal proceeding uh, 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 directly with the court. Uh, when the owner files this uh, lawsuit with the court, he can actually combine the criminal charge and the uh, civil action in the same lawsuit. In practice, uh, if the prosecutor uh, finally decides to drop the charge, then the owner may bring the charge on its own in a separate uh, private action. And maybe the owner can take advantage of the uh, evidence already collected by the police or the per, uh, prosecutor. You know, in practice, uh, the most effective way to enforce your trade secrets rights is uh, actually to pursue the criminal action. But uh, you know, the uh, criminal action is most uh, difficult or too difficult way to trigger. As we explained before, the police may be influenced by local protectionism, and the criminal threshold is high to reach. Etc. They got there are a lot of factors. Uh, what are the criminal punishments? Uh, if the infringement causes the owner to suffer more than half a million RMB, uh, but less than two point five million, the infringer shall be sentenced to no more than three years detention, and he may also get fined. Uh, if the crime is not serious, he may only be fined. You know, the fine uh, uh, should, not, should go to the government, not go to the, the uh, grieved party, the right owner. Uh, if the losses exceed 2.5 million RMB, he will be sentenced to over three years detention, but less than seven years, and he will be uh, fined. Okay. Okay, last part of uh, today's presentation. 
Uh, that is the recommended way to protect trade secrets in China. Uh, this is the uh, essence part of our today's presentation. Here we got five pages of slides. Number one page. I would recommend you to have some overall strategies to protect your trade secrets. Uh, you could first identify your core assets that could be protected as trade secrets in China. Some core assets may not be suitable to be protected as trade secrets uh, because it may be better to protect them as patents. So first, uh, first task, pick up the core assets that you think you could protect as trade secrets. So you can make a list, and this list should be as thorough uh, and uh, exclusive as possible. Please do not forget these important assets that could not be protected as any other IP address. For instance, uh, your client list, your future marketing strategies, etc. These may only be protected as trade secrets. Okay, after selecting your core assets, Please ask your lawyer to formulate uh, customized uh, strategies for trade secrets protection. When you find a suit, uh, suitable lawyers to do so, I will strongly recommend you to find a lawyer who has a litigation background because a lawyer with a contentious background knows how disputes arise. So he's in a better position to help you make uh, protection strategies. Third, I recommend you to establish an internal management system for the trade secret protection. Uh, you can ask someone in your legal department to enact uh, protection rules, to supervise the enforcement of these rules, etc. You, you can also ask people from your, say, technical department to cooperate with your in-house counsel to complete the task. Of course, you can also engage your outside lawyers to do the job. Fourth, learning something from the past experience of your competitors and your own company will always help. So please learn something from how the trade secrets have been stolen in your industry. So, so learn something from your competitors. Recommended ways, page number two. On this page, let's discuss how you should do to control your employees' behavior. This is very important because under most circumstances, your trade secrets are sent out by the intentional or negligent acts of your employees. So if you do nothing to control your employees, problems will come to you. First, Please ask every employee in your company to sign a non-disclosure agreement, i.e. NDA. Uh, you know, in China, the NDA should be better drafted in both Chinese and English language, or at least you should provide your employees with a Chinese trans uh, translation version and ask them to sign this Chinese version because this will avoid the situation where uh, your employees claim to have not fully understood the meanings of the NDA, the wordings of the NDA. And you may also want to send a letter to your uh, leaving employees' new company, uh, informing this company of your ex-employees' ongoing duty of protecting your company's trade secrets. Why do I recommend you to do so? Uh, you may recall at the start of my presentation, I listed several acts of trade secrets uh, infringement prohibited by the Chinese law. Uh, one act is that uh, Article 10 of the anti affair competition law uh, of TRC provides that where a third party uses the uh, trade secret of the others, when the third party has or should have full knowledge of the illegal acts of its new employee, then this company shall be deemed to have infringed upon the trade secrets of others. So if you inform your leaving uh, employee's new employer of the leaving employee's ongoing duty of protecting your trade secrets, then after being informed of that act, that company should protect your trade secrets 
find means of refraining from using the trade secrets. Or you can hold a living employee and this company jointly and severally liable for a tort. So there will be some benefit for, for you to inform your, uh, your living employee's newly joined uh, company. Okay, let's move on to page number three. Here, what do you do when you have cooperation with third parties? First and foremost, whenever you have a cooperation with a third party company, please consider asking it to sign NDA. Regardless of whether the transaction is a technology licensing, a trademark assignment, a potential partnership, or a deal for a joint venture, so the party shall bear some kind of uh, obligation to protect your trade secrets. And this NDA shall be signed even before the negotiation, so as earliest as possible. Last, you could uh, think about the uh, questions of who is the owner of the trade secret and who will be the owner of the trade secret after the transaction. This will help you know who has the right, uh, who has the power to enforce the uh, trade secret right. Once your trade secret right has uh, been uh, infringed, you could surely want to enforce your right, and you would want to enforce your right using the ways you preferred. You do not want to put that power into someone else's hands, even if uh, this, is some, this someone else is your uh, GV, uh, but still someone else because it's a different legal entity. So please keep that in mind. Okay, let's go on to the fourth page. On this page, we'll talk about uh, what you should do to strictly control the disclosure of your trade secrets. First, you can adopt a strict uh, technical measures to prevent unnecessary disclosure of your trade secrets. And then you may want to make all access to your trade secrets traceable. So you could perf uh, perfect your documentation system. You could record all use of trade secrets. Anyway, if there's a high possibility for others to steal or disclose your trade secret uh, while your employee's laptop, your computer server, or any part of your IT system, then you really should upgrade your IT system. Third, you may also want to separate your trade secret into different parts and limit access to each part to different groups uh, of people. So if any group doesn't have to know the other parts of the trade secret, please control or forbid their access to that part. It's easy to understand. Fourth, as we discussed, reverse engineering is not considered to be an infringement of the trade secret in, in China. So sometimes your competitors carefully study your, your products and try to figure that out. Uh, uh, what technology you have used in producing them, uh, but they usually lack some key information. So to produce the same products with your uh, company, your competitors do not need to get all the trade secrets in your products. They only need some core information. Once they get the core information, they can do the reverse engineering job. Thus, you could ask your R&D group to find out, well, first, what the key missing information is, and second, whether you have adopted sufficiently strict ways to protect the key information. So, in other words, protect your uh, secret information that may help your competitors to use reverse engineering to unearth your core technology. Last, I would recommend you to invite IT and legal experts to help you evaluate the potential risk of losing trade secrets. So maybe you can make an upgraded uh, evaluation whenever your company wants to market a new product or your company plans to restructure your internal management system. Okay. Last page. Uh, there are some other issues uh, you may want to hear. Uh, first, uh, you, you know, 
Uh, you don't want to infringe upon other com uh, companies, basically. So check whether your new employees are under the duties of NDA with other companies, and to what extent they are obligated to protect their ask uh, employers, basically. Second, when your secret is out, please do two things immediately. Number one. So whatever you can to reduce the negative effects. And number two, preserve as much evidence as possible. Because you may not uh, be so determined to commence legal actions against the infringer whenever you find uh, the, your uh, secrets out, but you must be well prepared for one. Third, you know, Mm, before you bring a tour uh, lawsuit against the infringer, please consider whether you have got sufficient evidence. If not, you may want to sue the infringer on a breach of contract claim. Of course, if you have signed a confidentiality contract with the infringer. Fourth, if you have one trade secret infringement case, uh, you should ask your attorney to thoroughly uh, analyze all three rem uh, remedies and options, uh, civil, criminal, and administrative, and try to take use of advantages of each option. But always keep in mind that the best way to keep away from infringement is to adopt well-established protection system, you are the ones. Yeah. Uh, Actually, this is uh, basically my presentation. Uh, I don't know whether uh, I've covered a thorough uh, explanation on the trade secret protection in China. But, uh, you know, if uh, anyone of you has any questions, uh, maybe you can ask me about that. Janet? Yeah, thank you so much, Lawyer Gui. I think it was very <laughs> thank thorough. You. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Can you let the people know how they can ask a question for the live listeners? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. To withdraw your question, press star 2. Once again, to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment while we wait for our first question. Uh, uh, Meth, this is Janice. Yeah. I, have, I have a question. Somebody emailed in a question. I'm going to read it to you. Um, yeah. You have lots of experience advising uh, companies. Um, is there one thing that you would tell these young, that these new companies to do that they're not doing, or is there something you would tell these U.S. companies to stop doing that they're doing? Just what would you tell them is your the most important practical advice? Uh, in terms of the protection of trade secret in China. I think uh, I think the most important thing is that uh, whenever you establish a presence in China, uh, you 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 will find a a, a Wufi or TV in China. Uh, you should uh, first uh, you know think of uh, how to adopt a, a very careful way to protect your trade secrets in China. Uh, so better to, as I said, uh, better to establish a well, uh, well established way to protect your trade secrets. Uh, maybe you can uh, ask the, uh, your, your, your U.S. lawyer and ask your Chinese lawyer who has experience uh, in China, and uh, may maybe you can also cooperate with your uh, China counsel. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the number one thing I want to remind is to, that uh, you you should be aware of the risk, uh, the potential risk of losing your trade secrets in China, uh, particularly uh, those core assets, as I mentioned uh, from the uh, starting of my presentation. So you should uh, uh, identify the core assets. Yeah, this is very, very important. And uh, I, I mean, I think uh, some core assets uh, are the kind of uh, common sense, uh, common sense assets that you should protect. For example, your client list and uh, uh, to whom you have uh, uh, con uh, uh, concluded a contract. And this uh, uh, information are very crucial for your company to to f 
further develop your Chinese business. So you really should uh, uh, well protect, uh, protect this uh, information. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you yeah. So before you go into your M&A, talk to your China lawyer and possibly bring in a China lawyer who's an expert and has litigated trade secret cases uh, to advise you at the very, very beginning. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, I don't know whether uh, anyone of you has, has uh, more questions. Maybe I, I just think uh, I have uh, some case experience. Maybe uh, I think uh, some of you may be interested in hearing my uh, past experience in representing my clients. Uh, so I can actually uh, take one case as an example. Uh, you know, in one case, I have handled my clients, a high-level manager left their company and joined their competitor's company. Uh, after the joining, uh, my clients highly suspected that the ex-employee has used my client's trade secrets in a new employer. Uh, my client has uh, indeed actually signed a confidentiality with this former manager. But, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, the governing law of this agreement is New York law. As my client's headquarters is located in New York City, what is worse, uh, this confidentiality agreement was, was signed between the former manager and my client's headquarters company in New York. But actually, this manager was uh, has, has a position uh, in both New York headquarters company and my client's uh, company, a company incorporated in China. Under such, uh, such circumstances, uh, my client faced two uh, problems. Number one, it is hard for them to enforce the signed confidentiality agreement in Chinese court because the governing law of the NDA is the New York law. And number two, my client may not have uh, standing to sue this former uh, manager for a breach of contract cause of action because literally my uh, client's China Incorporated Company has never signed any confidentiality agreement with this former manager. As you can imagine, my clients have assumed that uh, the signed confidentiality agreement will be fine, but it is not the case. It is not sufficient. It cannot provide uh, enough protection to my client. Of course, my clients can sue this former manager for a tort claim. But as I mentioned before, uh, then my client, uh, uh, the uh, China Incorporated Company, will bear a heavy burden of proof. Besides, my clients have never uh, signed any non-compete agreement with this high-level manager. So I guess... Their, future, uh, their failure to sign a non-compete agreement has allowed this former manager to join my client's competitor immediately after departure without any barrier. So from this case, uh, I think we can learn some lessons. Uh, number, number one, uh, please ask every employee in your company to sign a confidentiality agreement with your China Incorporated companies by adopting the uh, company law, the Chinese law. So in the event that there is uh, any a dispute of disclosing or using your uh, trade secrets without authorization, you can sue the former uh, employee at a Chinese court. And number two, uh, if your employee has several positions at several of your affiliated companies, then each of these affiliated companies should sign one confidentiality agreement with this employee. Number three, number three, please do not forget to require your high-level employees to sign a non-compete agreement so as to reduce the risk of leaking your trade secrets to your competitors. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, uh, I just uh, mentioned the one case uh, I have handled. Uh, maybe uh, uh, someone else will would like to ask uh, more questions. But uh, uh, don't worry if uh, they, they they don't have any questions right now. But uh, later on, they if they think of any, they can just write me an email. They can ask. Right. So anybody who's listening right now to the audio recording, um, Lawyer Guay said he would be happy to take questions. 
He has a Hotmail account. His email is guijia at hotmail.com. So you can email him any questions that you may have. Um, operator, are there any live questions? We have no questions at this time. Well, maybe it's because we're right at the top of the hour. Um, again, I wanted to thank lawyer Gway. Um, thank you. For this excellent presentation. Um, just to let you know, this presentation will be posted to the stopfakes.gov website. Where, where you can listen to the IDA recording in about three or four days. Um, you can also um, contact lawyer Gway if you have any questions, G-U-I-J-I-A at hotmail.com. Um, and while I have you on the line, just one plug next month on September 25th, we will have another um, China IP presentation. This one will be on preliminary injunctions. So again, uh, Lawyer Gway, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for participating in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.